Welcome to the University of Massachusetts, Boston. For those of you that I have not had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Keith. I'm Keith Motley. I'm so honored to be the chancellor here at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. But most importantly, we're so honored to have you in our presence today. I've never seen so many taxi cabs pulling out here on the harbor this morning. <laughs> many of them were lost. Yes, I saw you out my window, lost on the other end of campus, but you've made it here. You are in the right space. Now, we're so honored to have you on this campus this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for all that we're going to do together in the future. To the esteemed leader of this Commonwealth who could not be here with us this morning, but has several representatives all around this room, Governor Deval Patrick, we're honored to have his support. Um, from the very beginning of this effort, to the mayor of this great city of Boston, who happens to be a faithful alumni of this university. Thank you for your, president, for your presence this morning. Your message, image, and reputation, directly or indirectly, has helped this institution and also this city move forward. So we're so grateful to have you here, along with your strong leadership on this effort. Thank you. Thank you to all of you around this room. There's so many of you that are here. From our dear sheriff to I look around the room, you're all here. And some will be coming before you on this panel. But thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. You've gathered here today on this occasion to release the first annual report of the Commonwealth Compact Benchmark Initiative, Stepping Up, Managing Diversity, and Challenging Times. Let me also welcome you to this beautiful campus center here at the university. We're celebrating our fifth year. We put it to a lot of great use, but there's more use that can happen in this room. Know that this institution, your public university, is open to you. Know that this center is open to you. So come back again and again and again. We're hopeful that the beauty of this facility and the vistas it affords provides a fitting background for the grand and noble vision associated with the Commonwealth Compact. Here at this city's only public research university, we're deeply concerned about the perception of Boston around the nation and around the globe. That perception affects our ability to attract talent to our campus, be they students, be they faculty, or administrative leaders. We know that it also affects the ability to attract the talent to this city's corporations, nonprofits, and government agencies. We know that that perception affects our ability to retain residents in this city and even in this state. We know that that perception may even contribute to wedges that still exist among our own residents, traumatized in a time of divisive language, policy, and official and unofficial action. The urban mandate of this university compels us to engage this perception realistically, courageously, and practically so as to continue to push the city of Boston to the forefront in the leadership of the movement toward diversity, innovation, and economic regeneration. As one of the region's most diverse universities, we believe that the model for success in a global environment, because of the explosions in technology and communications, substantially more intimate than it has been ever been, is one that is open, welcoming, and dynamic for all people that comprise the globe. As I stated in several addresses to this community, back in 1964, when the legislature established the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the city of Boston was 90% white, about 9% African American, and just 1% Asian and others. Now, we look at a Boston that is more than 50% people of color. The younger generation is even more racially and culturally diverse. New immigrants have been our sole source of growth, more than 25% of Bostonians are foreign-born. As our city begins to look more like the world, 
so must the work of our city. If we un if were to unleash the full potential of the creati creativity and ingenuity that has coalesced at this time in this place. I stand with Dean Steve Crosby and the other Steve, the double Steves who sort of helped move us in this direction, who last year stated that it is time to seize the moment. So you like to quote me a lot, so I'm quoting you today. It is time to seize the moment. Now is the time to create a new reality and a new reputation. The times of racial and ethnic exclusion, division and segregation have passed, and we only seek to hasten the passing of their long-term effects on our culture, our institutions, and people's perceptions of this town we love called Boston and beyond. Today, as we peer into the looking glass formed from the benchmark initiative of the Commonwealth Compact, we look courageously at our reality. There may be some blemishes that are a little uncomfortable, but we look at it with gratitude and appreciation for the hard work of all of you in those, this room and those who have brought us to this point. But with this tool in hand, we move forward to the task of managing diversity in challenging times. And so, I thank you for making the choice to be part of this initiative. You didn't have to be here, but you are. I look around the room and I'm so grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here this morning. Caring enough about this city, our state, to work towards its transformation is a noble thing. And to aid in this vision, I'd like to ask you at this time to give your attention to the screen for a brief video presentation. Thank you. Just look around. Look around. Every neighborhood of Boston, from Hyde Square to Maverick Square, from Dorchester Avenue to Hyde Park Avenue, you can hear the 140 languages, taste the ethnic foods, experience the different cultures, and enliven the city of Boston. The variety, not just of backgrounds, but of talent, is extraordinary. And the notion that we wouldn't take advantage of that talent to advance our institutions and our community is absurd. The rich promise of the region's growing diversity must be tapped fully if Boston is to achieve its economic, civic, and social potential. That is the mission of Commonwealth Compact. The Commonwealth Compact is a unique and innovative opportunity to harness the power of our diverse communities, recognizing that that power increases our competitive advantage in every aspect of our civic life. It's our economic imperative as well to make sure that all of our residents have the opportunity to play a role in our state economy including to women and minorities, to individuals with disabilities, to members of the GLBT community, to the immigrant communities as well. The project conducted a survey of local boards of directors, finding a preponderance of white males on corporate boards and nonprofits alike, a preponderance profoundly unrepresentative of the makeup of our community. So we put forward efforts like Commonwealth Compact because we know that the best way to a prosperous community and future is through broad opportunity, equality, and fair play. Its whole being is predicated upon understanding the historical context that has brought us to this place today. For 300 years, our economic and social prosperity in Massachusetts was inextricably linked with our openness to diversity and our reputation for tolerance and inclusion. Out of 60 of the most prominent innovations in Massachusetts history, well over a third had women, immigrants, and minorities as prime movers. Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony led the women's suffrage movement. David Walker and his Walker's Appeal helped inspire the abolition movement. There were more black lawyers in Boston than almost any other northern city. In 1903, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote of Boston, it is the Negro's Mecca 
the heart of his political and educational future. Alexander Graham Bell, a Scottish immigrant, after witnessing a state house rally against the Ku Klux Klan, he wrote home to his father that Boston was the place he wanted to make his home. But by the mid-1900s, things had changed. New England's steady decline in traditional manufacturing, replaced by electronics, reinvigorated the economy, but prospered in the suburbs, not in the cities, left urban breeding grounds for economic competition and cultural conflict. These trends culminated in the unconstitutional segregation of the Boston public schools, symbolized by a single photo. That single image indelibly branded Boston as a racist city. As Washington Post columnist Michael Wilbon said during the discussion of Kevin Garnett's trade to the Boston Celtics, you have this history of bigotry against African American people in Boston, and black players know it, and you do not want to go voluntarily to Boston. And not just black people, but people of color. This conversation, he says, has been going on forever. And indeed, that conversation does go on. Ask virtually any young professional of color in our community. Ask him or her what their friends said about the possibility of moving to Boston. It is a negative brand which persists. That's why we're here today. The Commonwealth Compact will hold our collective feet to the fire through benchmarks and standards to help drive progress across our state. How many persons of color and women are on your board of directors? Is your workforce diverse and do the persons of color and women advance at rates comparable to white males? Does your customer base reflect the community? What share of the business you do with vendors and suppliers goes to minority and women-owned firms? Such questions are among the 25 benchmarks that all these organizations will use to help drive success. Together these organizations, big and small, and the many more we hope will join them, are making an important statement. How ready Boston is for this open discussion. We will make every effort to coordinate with the many organizations that have been doing this work for years. Organizations who are on the ground each and every day in their own way, helping to level the playing field here in Boston and making it a better place for each and every one of us. The Commonwealth Compact could not come at a better time. There is a new reality here that our city and state should now be seen as a welcoming place. And I want people from all walks of life throughout the country and the world to understand the advantages of living in this great state of Massachusetts. I want to encourage everyone, especially our friends in the private sector, to be part of this compact. We have set an audacious and an important goal. You are going to make it happen. It's not about us, it's about us. And I am ready to march. And I hope you are too. It still, still gives me goosebumps to see that. We had intended that after the governor said he was ready to march, he would in fact come up here and be our next speaker. Um, we found out late yesterday, almost yesterday evening, that he had to go to Washington uh, peremptorily for something important. None of us wants to speculate, um, but he's not able to be with us this morning. Uh, and in his stead, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, a real friend. Many of you know Arthur Bernard. Arthur was Vice Chancellor for Community Affairs here at UMass Boston who, when I got to know him. Um, after he had not been here very long, the governor stole him, and he's now the Secretary of Cabinet Affairs in the governor's office. He has a long, distinguished career in, in uh, government, in politics, and uh, and community activities in Boston, and we're proud to have you here. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, 
Um, let me start by saying that the governor is uh, not here today. He asked me to extend his apologies to all of you. Um, he was asked to go to Washington, D.C. to participate in a major policy announcement uh, by the Obama administration um, on auto emission standards, um, along with Governor Granholm and uh, Governor Schwarzenegger from California. So I have the pleasure and the honor to address you this morning on behalf of Governor Patrick. We have a lot to be grateful for here today as we celebrate one year of the Commonwealth Compact. I want to acknowledge Ron Milo for his extraordinary leadership on this project. If you don't already know Ron, he is a champion of access and opportunity. We are lucky to have him as part of our team in state government, and I hope you will continue to work with him to bring the solutions we need to the challenges we face in our Commonwealth today. Since the launch of this compact one year ago, the world has gone through an unprecedented economic turmoil. We are, as you know, in the throes of the worst recession in generations. But against that backdrop, we have also taken historic steps forward on the road to opportunity. With the election of President Obama, a barrier fell and millions of black boys and girls across this nation began seeing new possibilities in their lives. That is a fundamental change in their thinking, and it is moving and exhilarating. But the real work has just begun, because in truth, those boys and girls and the millions of people on the Mall in January for the inauguration know that America did not change just because Barack Obama was elected president any more than Massachusetts changed just because Deval Patrick was elected governor. You know that too. And so does President Obama. The sweat and toil and setbacks and heartbreak of lasting change is just starting. The scope of change we voted for and the nature of change itself guarantees that an uneven and sometimes bumpy road lies ahead. But we will get there together. We will conquer the obstacles, meet the challenge, and make Massachusetts an example of inclusiveness and opportunity for the nation. We will help families in Mattapan and Dorchester write their chapters of the American story. Because increasing diversity in the workplace is about more than helping traditionally marginalized communities gain a foothold in society of secure prosperity important as that is. It's also about bringing all of us closer together as a community, strengthening the human connections we share, and tearing down the walls of prejudice and ignorance that needlessly separates us. It's about celebrating everything we share in common while giving working families new reason to hope. Governor Patrick asked me to announce today that the state is a signer of the compact. The Commonwealth will spearhead this effort to expand access and opportunity for diverse communities. Already, 111 Massachusetts companies have stepped up and established a baseline for how we are doing with diversity in our workplace. Make no mistake, we have a lot of work to do. If we are to realize the success we dream of, we can never rest. Determined hard work is our answer. We need, as many, we need as many employers as possible to participate in this effort. The Commonwealth has submitted its benchmarks. If you are an employ, employee, ask your company to join. If you are an employer, recruit other businesses to join this effort and expand the circles of opportunities to every one of our neighbors in every one of our neighborhoods. Only when we get there, will we be able to point and say, there. That's what change looks like. On behalf of Governor Patrick, I thank you all for your hard work and for being here today. Keep up the good work. It is also my uh, honor and uh, privilege now to introduce to you the Mayor of Boston, 
uh, one of the leaders in diversity and access for all, Mayor Menino. Uh, thank you, Arthur, for being here this morning, stepping in for the, the Gov, and uh, it's great to be at this meeting once again, the Commonwealth Compact. And first of all, I want to say I'm the City of Boston has signed on as a member of the Commonwealth Compact. And also, and also that uh, we will work with the Compact on our numbers as we go forward to show that uh, we are a city that really is open, a city that works with all our people, because I look at Boston as a city of diversity, and that diversity is represented not just in the neighborhoods of Boston, but I hope in the administration uh, that we have at City Hall. It's difficult, but we're getting there every day and trying to make it work. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ralph Martin for being part of this, Steve Ainsley, Steve Crosby, and Bob Turner for all your hard work and for Carol Hendy Fendi, Fenta for all the work she's done in stepping up. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank uh, Reverend Tan, who leads our Office of New Bostonians. And uh, Boston Housing Authority Administrator Sandra Enriquez, who, uh, for their work on the compact and leading our, priori leading our priority to make sure city government mirrors the residents of Boston. But first of all, President Obama nominated, and the President says he nominated, I say he stole, <laughs> Sandra Enriquez to be the Assistant Secretary of Public Housing and Indian Affairs in his administration. While it's sad for Sandy leaving, it's a great reflection on our city and the work we're doing together. And Sandy going off to Washington is great for our city, but it's a great loss for Boston. She was a spectacular individual who did a great job of public housing. You know, when she, there are the years you spent there, you didn't have the nonsense you had previously at the Housing Authority. You worked there, the Housing Authority that worked for the people who lived there, and that was so important. I always say about Sandra, she worked during the very difficult times when there wasn't any money. She made it a great place. Can you imagine if she was there now? The Obama money? Wow. <laughs> we'd, have, we'd have Taj Mahal's there. But she did a heck of a job, and uh, it's really sad to see her leave to go to Washington, but I'm happy for her because uh, of the opportunity she gives America for her leadership ability. Here in Boston, we've made a lot of progress, good progress. Our neighborhoods are filled with sights, sounds, and tastes from around the world. Never had Boston been so inclusive, diverse, and tolerant. And I tell you, I was saying on the table there, Bill Russell, when he played basketball in Boston, he hated Boston. He hated it because of the way he was treated. He came back to Boston several years ago, and he was a guest of mine. He says, you know, Mayor, Boston's a changed city. We're a city much different than when I played basketball here. More tolerant, more inclusive than been in the past. And that's a guy who really had a difficult time when he played in our city. You know, just look at today's um, election of the third Suffolk house race. It includes a Latina from Beacon Hill, an Italian from the South End, a Jewish man from the North End. Boston has changed. We have grown. We have broken down barriers. But much work is left. That's what the Commonwealth Compact is all about. Open the doors to more people of color and women at all the levels of employment. Making sure everyone has a seat at the table. On behalf of the City of Boston, I am proud that we're part of this Commonwealth Compact, and we will support it as we move forward. I want to encourage everyone here, especially our friends in the private sector, to join the compact. We need to give opportunities more available for people of color at every level, from the stock room to the boardroom. That's so important. Look at the boards of all our corporations, our nonprofits. We need more diversity on those boards. A diverse workforce strengthens your organization whether it's a business, a nonprofit, or a government. When employees reflect the, the community they serve, 
their product and services will be improved because they better understand their clients, their customers, their patients, and their constituents. I see this firsthand. Boston, like was said earlier from the Chancellor, Boston is a minority majority city, and people of color occupy nearly half of all of our appointed board positions in City Hall. I'm proud to have women so well represented in my cabinet and also as department heads throughout our government. Our Office of New Bostonians, Reverend Tom, once again, works to help immigrants succeed. We've achieved results. We've held ourselves accountable. The report of the Commonwealth Compact will also see greater transparency on the part of the private and nonprofit sector. We'll help our collective feet, we'll hold our collective feet to the fire and drive progress across our state. Yes, much work remains. Let's also recognize the progress we have made. Working together, we can cement our reputation as a welcoming place of opportunity and achievement for all our people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As he has done for many years, um, our mayor walks the walk. He doesn't just talk the talk, and it's reflected in his community. And as he's talking, and as we know about his community, I was thinking, you know what I want out of this? I want to go to the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce breakfast, or the BC Executive Forum, or the AIM annual meeting, or the Business Roundtable annual meeting, and I want it to look like this room. That's what I'd like to get out of the Commonwealth Compact. Two quick things um, before I introduce uh, Carol Hardy Fanta. I'd like to have the signers of the Commonwealth Compact, representatives of the signers of the Commonwealth Compact who are here today, please stand and let me lead the applause. This is not uh, easy work, and you'll hear as you learn more about this, this is not easy work. This is work, um, building on the progress of the past, and I deeply appreciate all of these organizations who are undertaking that work. I'd also like to ask members of the Advisory Council of the Commonwealth Compact to stand, who have been with us for two and a half years as we've been figuring this out. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> And I just want to say one other thank you. Um, these are very, very tough times financially. We all know it. Um, I'd like to thank the Barr Foundation, Bingham McCutcheon, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, the Hyams Foundation, my own school and UMass Boston, Partners Healthcare, Robert Half International, Staples, the Boston Foundation, Stop and Shop for their generous financial support that makes this work possible. Thank you. My pleasure now is to introduce to you um, a friend and the woman who will lead the main topic today, which is the, the uh, results of the benchmark study, Dr. Carol Hardy Fanta. Many of you know Carol. Um, I'm going to give you some of her resume because it's impressive. She's the director of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy in, I'm proud to say, the McCormick Graduate School, and has been an intellectual and driver of the integrity of this initiative from the very first moment I walked in the door. She received her PhD in public policy from Brandeis, an MSW from Smith, and a BA from Occidental. She's a nationally recognized scholar on Latina and Latino academics, and has published widely, including three books, on the intersection of gender, race, and ethnicity in politics and public policy. And she's directed all of the research of the initial two studies that we did two years ago that underpinned intellectually and substantively and factually the design and strategy of the Commonwealth Compact. Um, Carol, please lead off. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to say that May is a wonderful month. I realized that it was in May of 2007 that our 
seat at the table report on diversity in state, corporate, hospital, higher education boards was released. It was May, almost a year ago today, in which the Commonwealth Compact launched here in this very uh, ballroom. And here we are today in May, uh, letting you know, sharing with you some of the information that has been gathered and analyzed on to s establish a baseline from which progress on diversity can be measured going forward. I want to thank Steve Crosby for, and Steve Ainsley and Ralph Martin and the steering committee for initiating this project. I think it has the potential for achieving something that has uh, just begun in the springtime of the season, but also the springtime of real change in the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts. This project that I'm going to report on today was not done alone. The Commonwealth Compact team of Bob Turner, Colleen Powell, and now Georgiana Melendez uh, gathered information that we analyzed. When I say we, our center is a collaborative research uh, a center, and central to our work in analyzing this report, I'd like to recognize Krista Kelleher, stand up, our research director. She led the way and is such an excellent writer. I value your input tremendously. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this without Krista. Paige Ransford, our senior research associate. And Sunny Thompson, uh, evidence of the excellence that our PhD program uh, produces. She and Paige were, uh, really did the job of going through every template, entering all the data, really making sure that we have accurate numbers and could analyze them uh, accurately and in a meaningful way. I also want to acknowledge Donna Stewartson. Could you stand up? Donna Stewartson was the lead <laughs> of this massive project that we had 13 people working on back in uh, early uh, uh, 2007 to do the board analysis study, we had something like 9,000 uh, uh, board members at the state level and 4,000 in the, uh, at the, uh, the corporate and municipal and uh, I mean, corporate uh, higher education and healthcare fields. And that, to get gender is e relatively easy, but to get race from all every one of these uh, organizations was a massive undertaking. And, um, so I want to acknowledge Donna, and I want to put a little plug in. Uh, we are accepting uh, applications to our graduate certificate program for women in politics and public policy, uh, which Donna is the key, key there. So I do want to say before I start with the presentation that on your tables there are cards. We would like you to, um, if you have questions, to hold your questions, write them down on these cards. Um, and at some point, they're going to be collected, so your questions can be gathered. We won't be able to answer all of them, but uh, please do write your questions down, and someone will come around and gather them up. And wave, wave them in the air, and, uh, and someone will come by and, and pick them up, okay? All right, I would like to start by talking about Commonwealth Compact. You've gotten some information, but it is an initiative to make Massachusetts a location of choice for people of color. It is a public commitment by companies and organizations to recruitment, hiring, management, and government's practices that increase the representation of people of color and women in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It is innovative and trend-setting. There has been a lot of attention to workforce diversity over the past few years, d decades, really. In the United States, scholarship indicates, however, that there's minimal attention paid to the assessment of diversity strategies deployed by businesses, nonprofits, and government entities. In other words, people talk a lot about diversity, they may commit to it, but there actually is not something concrete being done to really look at whether those diversity strategies work and to follow them over time. So I think that the Commonwealth Compact is really innovative and trend-setting and should be a model for the nation. 
The mission of Compact, Compact is to establish Massachusetts as a uniquely inclusive, honest, and supportive community of and for diverse people, to acknowledge our mixed history in this effort, and to face squarely the challenges that still need to be overcome, understanding that the rich promise of the region's growing diversity must be tapped fully if Boston and Massachusetts are to achieve their economic, civic, and social potential. In order to set a benchmark for measuring progress on a number of important indicators, Commonwealth Compact developed a benchmark, a set of indicators and then a benchmark. And the benchmark uh, document is included in the back of the report in your uh, packet. Uh, I should hold up the report so you can see what it looks like if you haven't seen it yet. The 126 people who were signers who were, or, or companies that had signed on at the time when data were being collected, um, 111 signers submitted benchmark template data. This reflects an 88% response rate, which is quite remarkable. This means that the data you're going to hear about today is representative of the signers as a whole. It is not necessarily representative of all companies and organizations and institutions across the state, but it is scientifically uh, representative of the signer, of all signers. The benchmark template gathered data, quantitative data, on racial and ethnic gender diversity of leadership teams, boards, employees, customers, consumers, and services, and on the size of the organization corporation in using um, revenue, budget, and number of employees. The number of employees was gathered both for the company as a whole, even for national companies, and we asked also for how, how many employees they had by racial group and gender in uh, Massachusetts. The responders were invited to answer a certain number of survey questions about CEO commitment to diversity, any mentoring or training programs that were available to management on diversity, the recruitment strategies used, and civic and other initiatives to understand and promote diversity, inclusion, and racial, ethnic, and gender equality, and much more. The signers represent a large portion of employers and employees in Massachusetts. There are about 180,000 people working for these signers companies in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, many more for national companies, obviously hundreds of thousands, but we asked them to, uh, to or the Commonwealth Compact asked them to uh, say how many people work by racial group in uh, Massachusetts. And this 180,000 who work in Massachusetts reflect, represents about 5.5% of the state's 3.29 million people in 2007, non-farm. Um, the total revenues of the signers add up to over $55 billion. The sizes range from fewer than five employees to 100,000 or more. 59% have fewer than 250 employees, and the median number of employees in Massachusetts is 165. Now, about the compact signers, um, one of the things that was interesting to uh, Commonwealth Compact was to find out what sectors these uh, signers re represent. And we found this uh, chart shows that 18% of signers are for profit companies, 14% are in the healthcare sector, and the healthcare sector can be nonprofit or for profit, primarily nonprofit um, healthcare and insurance providers. 21% are in the education sector, primarily colleges and universities, and 42% are nonprofit organizations outside of the healthcare and, and, um, edu and higher education sectors. Now, on to the key findings. These are just some of the findings in this report. The report's relatively short and has a lot of white space, but it's pretty packed with information. So please read it so you'll get all the uh, information we've uh, provided. Uh, the data show that signers embrace diversity as a benefit to their businesses. One of the signers wrote, we need to make diversity work because it will make us a better at what we do. 
broader and deeper as thinkers, more effective as collaborators, more creative as teachers, understanding as friends, and wiser, less complacent, and most, more self-aware as human beings. They believe workforce, di workplace diversity has improved in the last five years. 100% say they not only value a diverse workforce and customer base, but actively solicit the input of their, and participation of their employees of color. 80% say that workforce diversity has improved in the last five years. 97% of CEOs say they are actively engaged in diversity efforts. And 79% say diversity is explicitly referenced among the organization's, or values, organization's values or goals. But they feel that there's a long way to go. And if we move to the actual numbers of workplace diversity in the state, we should start with about 18% of the labor force are people of color, and about 27% of the labor force in the two counties most reflected by the signers, where the signers have offices, Suffolk and Middlesex counties. Our analysis uh, shows that the signer, the 27% of those in the Suffolk and Middlesex are people of color. Our analysis shows that the signers have a, a slightly higher percentage of people of color 34% uh, is the mean, uh, the average of all employees, 22% of managerial positions and above, 25% uh, of professional uh, and sales uh, 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 employees, and 37% of clerical, laborer, and technical positions. As you can see, obviously, the lower end has the highest percentage of uh, employees, but they're about a quarter of the employees in uh, the signers' organizations are people of color. And that's relatively close to the uh, overall percentage in um, Suffolk and Middlesex counties. Racial diversity is, in employment is considerably more substantial for Commonwealth Compact signers uh, than for employers in the state's labor force. This is likely in large part due to the fact that the vast majority, 81% of the signers at this moment in time, are located in Boston or have offices in Boston, a majority minority city that has a potential pool of employees of color that is larger than that of the state as a whole. While we did not, while we recognize that um, diversity means much more than ju just racial and, and gender diversity um, uh, in terms of but, uh, disability, uh, GBLT, et cetera, um, we basically are focusing at this point on racial and ethnic and gender diversity. And we found that among signers, women make up two-thirds of all employees, and 59% holding those of the position of manager or officer, and 59% of the professional or sales positions. Managers and officers um, hold, or, or as a percentage of employee, employees, is higher than the census reports of you for Massachusetts, which is 41%. So that's something to tease out as we go forward. We also looked at workforce diversity by sector, and I don't know if you can see the, uh, the slide exactly, but um, we found that 44% of employees are in the health care sector are people of color, and 37% in the other not for profit sector. So those are the two bars that are the height is the uh, health care and uh, the not for profit. The, uh, Slightly lower ones are um, uh, in for-profit, which is 24%, and higher education, or education, which is 21%. Now, I was, I was reading the Globe on Monday, and it said specifically that if you're doing a PowerPoint a presentation, a really big no-no is to put up a table that's too detailed. So. I recognize that this table is too detailed. Um, you'll have to read the report to get all the facts. But I have highlighted a couple of things in yellow to sort of point out the key things that I'd like to focus on. People of color make up, on average, the highest percentages of managers and officers. That's the first row uh, in the healthcare field, where you see it's 24.5%, and the other not-for-profit, which is 29%. Oops, sorry, sorry. Um, 
People of color make up, on average, the highest percentage of managers and officers in not-for-profit organizations. And, sorry, I already said that. Um, at the level of manager and officer, the mean percent of people of color is higher in education, uh, which is 18% than in the non-for-profit sector. Those are the uh, uh, other two um, not highlighted. The red circle highlights the fact that one of the reasons some uh, sectors are so high overall is that the diversity at the lower end of the uh, professions of clerical, uh, labor, and technical, as you can see here in the healthcare field, which had a, one of the highest um, rates of diversity uh, that I mentioned before of 29%, uh, of, uh, um, no, sorry, 24%. You can see that the, uh, at the lower end, the healthcare uh, diversity is 55%. Uh, so there is a larger percentage of people of color working at the lower end of the um, employment specter. Now, in terms of leadership diversity, what we should note is that there are many opportunities for increasing the diversity in leadership among the signers. There are about 1,500 positions on leadership teams and more than 2,000 board positions. So that if you add up all the total positions available to have representation of people of color, there's a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of people and positions you can fill. But we found that 23% of companies and organizations had no person of color on their leadership team, and 11% had none on their governing board. More on leadership diversity. When asked directly, are you satisfied with the diversity of your leadership team? Fewer than half responded that they were satisfied, 48%. And on a related note, only 76% said non-whites advance as fast as whites, while 98% felt that women advance as uh, fast as men. One of the most important features of improving uh, efforts to improve diversity is the CEO leadership on diversity, the director's leadership. And the Commonwealth Compact benchmark template asked a lot of questions about uh, CEO leadership in terms of whether the, the CEO is actively engaged, uh, sets diversity targets, impacts ma uh, manager compensation and, and, uh, and manager promotion. When asked about valuing diversity, 100% of the signers say that they not only value a diverse workforce and customer base, but actively solicit their input and participation. However, and as you can see by this chart, 97% are actively engaged in diversity efforts. That's that bar on the bottom. And 79% said, diversity is explicitly referenced among the organization's goals. And as you can see here, however, only 19% said that diversity performance impacts manager compensation, and only 37%, that's the top bar, said that diversity performance impacts manager promotion. Now, what are some of the things that the companies and organizations do to improve diversity? Among Commonwealth Compact signers, 85% place help-wanted advertising in ethnic media, 77% say they offer, offer mentoring programs, and 69% say they have persons trained to investigate discrimination. However, the strongest me mechanisms are used the least. Only 41% require that people of color or women be included among those being considered for job openings. And only 40% survey their employees on issues concerning diversity in the workforce. So when you think back about the 100% of signers who said they value diversity, but if only 40% are actually surveying their workers about what it's like to work for their company or surveying their customers about whether there are job openings for people of color, then there may be a little bit of 
over optimism about how good things might be, and that's an area where I'll talk about one of the recommendations. Also, man, as I said earlier, managers' performance with diversity issues um, are a factor in promotion, only 37 percent, and in considering compensation, only 19 percent. So that's an area where, yes, diversity might be important in these companies, but doesn't count towards uh, manager promotion or compensation nearly as much as it might. Under recommendations now, in these recommendations are uh, explained in more detail in the uh, report, but I'll just list them here. The first is to integrate diversity goals into the strategic planning process of the organization and not consider them as a separate um, objective or effort. To establish and foster employee groups that allow for employees to weigh in on workplace climate in respect to diversity. Conduct scientifically rigorous employee satisfaction surveys that are confidential and can be analyzed by the race, ethnicity, and gender of the employees. And survey the customer base and the population of the communities in which they are located, especially around job opportunities and hiring. Gather data on promotion retention rates of employees of color and women. Collect and track data on outreach mechanisms for identifying and contracting purchasing from minority and women-owned suppliers and vendors. And address board diversity in a much more robust way by updating careful records on board members by race, ethnicity, and gender. Having boards implement a formal assessment process of the board's own performance on achieving diversity goals and adopting or endorsing a diversity policy and setting diversity goals for board service. What I would like to let you know before I conclude is that there are many valuable resources in the report at the back in the list of references. Nobody reads the references, but there's actually a lot of very important and valuable um, resources that are available online about how to improve diversity, including a nice little box at the back where on page 13 where you can collect, you can actually download this, this uh, how to improve diversity report. And then on page 13, there's a tips from the signers in their own words about things they've used, sort of best practices that have, they have used to help improve diversity in their organization or company. So I thank you all for listening. I will take some questions, um, a small number, as we move through the program. Thank you very much. I've been asked, what is the single most disturbing data point? I think I would say that the, there are two. One is the fact that only 40% of the companies and organizations said they survey their employees or their customer base about workforce satisfaction and um, opportunities for hiring, hiring practices. I think that's disturbing because it, because of that fact that 100% of the signers said everything is great. Not they didn't say everything was great, but they were saying that, you know, we value diversity. So there could be gaps. How are you going to know if your hypothetical valuing of diversity is um, having a good effect? for the people of color that work for you or would like to work for you if you don't actually talk to them and ask them in a scientifically protected way, uh, what's it like working here? Or what's it like being in this community and trying to get a job in this company or trying to get on a board? That's one of the most important. Uh, I think the other is uh, the fact that um, manager compensation and performance are, is relatively low compared to some of the other easier mechanisms. So for example, it's relatively easy to say um, I have created and written a diversity um, statement for the company. That's something that can be done and most of the uh, people that reported said they had done that. But in terms of tying management compensation and pr promotion to achieving diversity is, is, is something that I think could be harder to do but would probably have big effects. Other questions? Oops, like, 
She looks Vanna White. <laughs> the envelope, please. Who answered the survey question within the organization? Well, among the recommendations um, for this project going forward is to collect data on that very point. It's not clear from this year's effort what the, who exactly did uh, fill it out and that there, I think there was variation between the groups. Um, uh, in some cases, it would be the HR person. In some cases, it might be the director or a staff person at a small organization. There was such variety among the kinds of organizations and companies that obviously a large one might delegate it to someone. But I think we do need to, uh, in the future, or the Commonwealth Compact needs to, in the future, um, collect that information, both in terms of the type of position that person has, um, maybe even the race and ethnicity and gender of the person as well. So I think that's a, a recommendation. It's a methodological recommendation going forward. And let's see, there's another one here. How can employers make the workforce more comfortable to have constructive discussion, dialogue, and conversation on diversity topics? Well, that was actually interesting. I once went to um, a prominent university, private university, and I actually should, won't name names, about 10 years ago and said, can you talk about what you do here to improve diversity, to discuss diversity? And the, I think it was the dean, or the assistant dean said, oh, we tried that once, and oh, it was terrible, we don't want to do it again, we don't do it. Now, I think things have changed somewhat, but I think that's a very good question, and it will take, um, uh, an effort to look at the kinds of best practices are out there. There are so many um, experiences that are documented. The literature on improving diversity in workforce is, is huge. Um, and I think Sunny Thompson, again, stand up, Sunny. Uh, she's going after the Urban Institute this summer, but she's back in the fall. So we've been collecting uh, information about that. And uh, those kinds of activities are available. So rather than just sort of let's have a group and talk about it and not be cognizant of the potential uh, uh, repercussions the individuals might feel, um, uh, we need to take those things into account. But they can be done and they have to be done in a sensitive way that protects employees from any repercussions. Okay. Oh, this is a long one. Last question. What is the quantitative or qualitative evidence to support the finding that 76% of signers reported that people of color advance in their organizations at the same rate as white people? Certainly that is not the perception. I doubt it is a reality. Isn't that one of the reasons we must do this work? Absolutely, absolutely. The questions about, if you look at the benchmark template in the back, there are a number of questions that are survey questions. They are yes and no. And one of the questions specifically is, and I'd have to look for the, here it is, it's question number 13A on page 21 that asks simply, do you believe people of color advance their careers at least at the same rate as whites do in your organization? It's a yes, no by the person filling out this. The fact that, I think it's less important whether that's inflated in some way. It's a perception based on the people filling it out. I think that's why asking the same questions about the, from the employee standpoint and the community standpoint, and then having these dialogues about these ch uh, challenging perceptions. And I think Steve's gonna talk a little bit about one of the early uh, stimuli for this project was that even predates a seat at the table, which is um, uh, a poll that was done that I was involved in also looking at feelings of discrimination um, by whites and people of color. And I think, I think you already mentioned that, right? So I'll let Steve have the last word on that topic. But there are differences, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. 
I would remind you of one thing, that the, the data that's reflected is the data from the signers. Um, it may or may not, in fact it does not, have a lot to do with what organizations across co the, the Commonwealth look like. We clearly have the low apples on the tree, um, but that's what this is about. It's for the signers to look at themselves, ourselves, and figure out how we're doing and how we can do better. Um, that the last meeting, uh, with the launch of the Commonwealth Compact back on May 23rd, we had a host of VIPs, and Chancellor Motley did a great move um, to avoid the risk of failing to introduce somebody. He said, if you're a very important person, would you please stand up and be recognized? <laughs> Which was great. However, there are two people here I do want to recognize who have been at the beginning of this and helping us work on this. Sam Yoon, city councilor from Boston, who is, did he leave? Oh, I'm sorry, Sam, my apologies. Um, and Andrea Cabral, Sheriff of Suffolk County, who is still here. Both Sam. <laughs> both Sam and Andrea have been a part of this from the very beginning, and, uh, and we much appreciate it. And I hope if there's somebody here from Sam's office, you'll tell them that we remembered. I'm not 100% sure how uh, useful this next part of this conversation will be. Um, but I wanted to take a shot at it anyway. I think it's implicit in a lot of our conversation. By the way, I'm Steve Crosby, for those of you I don't know. I'm the dean of the McCormick Graduate School uh, of Public Policy Studies at UMass Boston, I'm proud to say. Um, but people have said to me, you know, why are you doing this? Um, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, why did I team up back with Steve Ainsley originally, uh, Ralph Martin and Bob Turner to lead the Commonwealth Compact? For starters, for me, the Commonwealth Compact is personal. This is why I'm leading the Commonwealth Compact. Not that. Almost 20% of the population of you heard, the population of Massachusetts is minority. More than half of the population of Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, of the city of Boston is minority. All of the population growth in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is foreign-born immigrants, the large majority from Latin America. If it were not for immigrants, we would have a shrinking labor force and we would probably lose a seat in Congress. Yet, remember these numbers from the slides that we saw earlier from the video. Now, these are not the signers of the Commonwealth Compact. These are major organizations across the Commonwealth the boards of directors and the other leadership levels uh, of major institutions across this country, across this commonwealth, do not represent in any way the population and the growing population of the commonwealth of Massachusetts. And from another study that Carol Hardy Fanet did for us at the beginning of the Commonwealth Compact, look at the different life experience that people of color have in Massachusetts from the white community. Virtually no white person ever experiences discrimination. 10 to 25% of blacks and Latinos have experienced dis discrimination either in the job market or housing or law enforcement within the last year. And although our minority population is growing dramatically, 20% across the state, about a third within greater Boston, 50% in the city of Boston, our racial or groups live almost exclusively with one another and don't uh, interact very much at all with other folks. 80 plus percent of the white community in Massachusetts, notwithstanding those other numbers, only interact with other white people. I don't want to live and work in a community that fails to incorporate the rich diversity of our population into its leadership and into its culture. And I said, this is personal, look at this. These are excerpts from a memo that was written to me from a student in one of my college's PhD programs. In it, the student thoughtfully describes the subtle discrimination and he that, and other Latino students have experienced in my school. He describes subtle discrimination, a form of discrimination often inadvertent, unintentional, and unconscious. Um, and he went on to describe personal experiences that he had had at an academic social event, somebody walked him into him and said, what are you doing here? He said, I was invited. The person who asked the question ignored him from that point on. That's subtle discrimination that I have heard back from many, particularly Latino students, in my college. I don't want to be a dean of a college that fails to incorporate the rich diversity of our population into its leadership 
and into its culture. The soul of this country has been a relentless effort to reconcile the interests of diverse ethnicity, age, wealth, religion, sexual orientation, and physical capabilities into the glory of a pluralistic, equitable, and prosperous economy and democracy. I want our community to be in the forefront of that honorable endeavor. And I know I share that wish with many people in this room, probably everybody in this room, and many people across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But the Commonwealth Compact is about more than a personal wish. It's about a clear-eyed, hard-nosed sense of our own self-interest. The world around us is changing unimaginably quickly and unimaginably profoundly. This is the leadership of the House Committee on Financial Services, which regulates the most powerful and probably the most white industry in America. Four of the subcommittee chairs are African American or Latino. Louis Gutierrez, Maxine Waters, Melvin Watt, and Gregory Meeks. Not to mention that the chair is a gay man. And here's another example of the change that's going on around us. UCLA is advertising in the New York Times, trolling for students, faculty, and money, focusing on Latinos, and emphasizing its culture of universal possibilities. One ad quoted a man saying, when I came to UCLA in the spring of 1967, it was like most American universities then, very much the domain of a specific population that didn't include people who looked like me. We can now talk about UCLA being a place of universal possibility. These are ads running in our town. And look what these ads said about California. So where's the next big change, the next big opportunity? The global economy, of course. What's California's role? Are we up to the challenge? Absolutely. If you ever wonder what the rest of the world looks like, check out your local mall. California is the most diverse society on the planet, the first state in the union to become a majority of minorities. As the song says, we are the world. This is the world that our businesses, our higher ed education, and our hospitals are competing in. And then there's the influence of our new president. As Bob Turner and I pointed out in a recent Globe op-ed, the election of an African-American executive does not solve the problems of institutional racism or of the deeply personal misunderstandings and prejudice among people of different races and ethnicity that have for so long afflicted our state and our country. However, the selection of a minority chief executive, a governor, a president, a chancellor, or a CEO, does make a powerful statement about a people's willingness to embrace change and offers an opportunity to drive that change throughout our institutional and personal systems. The election of an African-American president with a Muslim middle name and a vast global constituency adds another dimension to this challenge and opportunity for us. The need for our communities to match the diversity, tolerance, and global perspective of our president in the rapidly evolving global marketplace. In a recent New York Times article, this Obama effect was discussed in the context of casting non-white actors for television. Ben Silverman, co-chairman of NBC Entertainment, said, we were going after diversity regardless, but I don't think you can deny the power that Barack Obama brings in magnifying this direction in our world. We've all been colorblind for years, but the results don't necessarily match up to our intentions. I think we've all said that. Paula Madison, head of the Diversity Initiative for NBC International, added, people are not living in single-race silos anymore. We said, let's try to develop a world that looks like the world we're living in. This same Obama effect, coupled with the extraordinary globalization of business, sociology, and travel, will doubtless have a similar effect on other industries, including the drivers of our Commonwealth's economy medicine, education, defense contractors, high tech, and the life sciences. To be competitive, our economy and our culture will need to be diverse, tolerant, and inclusive, from the entry level of our workforce to our senior management and boards of directors. This, as you've heard, is the mission of the Commonwealth Compact, to establish Massachusetts as a uniquely inclusive, supportive community of and for diverse peoples, Understanding that the rich promise of this region's growing diversity must be tapped fully if Boston and Massachusetts are to achieve their economic, civic, and social potential. Our strategy at the Commonwealth Compact has been to 
to change the reality of diversity in the Commonwealth, and thus to change the brand of our community from one that is seen or certainly has been seen as inhospitable to people of color to one that is distinguished by its inclusivity and multicultural competence. As best we've been able to research, the Commonwealth Compact is a unique initiative in this country. Nowhere else has the senior leadership of government, business, academics, and the nonprofit sector committed to such a comprehensive ass assessment of its own diversity and ability to work with diverse peoples. And nowhere else has such a broad-based commitment been made to systematically report upon and improve that performance. Massachusetts, yet again, is boldly facing its challenges and leading the nation in perfecting our union. If we do this right, the Commonwealth Compact can set a standard for our country's continuing evolution toward becoming a minority-majority country, and we can help cement a leadership position for Massachusetts in the global economy. This is what the Commonwealth Compact means to me. And this is why I'm so proud to be here with you this morning. Thank you. My next job um, is to introduce the panel, which will be the last part of our presentation. Um, most of you know Dr. Beverly Edgel, who will uh, run that panel, but if I want to read a little bit about her anyway. She's the president and chief executive officer of the Partnership, a nonprofit leadership development and career mentoring organization for multicultural, multicultural professionals of color. In her role as CEO, she oversees a $2 million budget. She's expanded the, the partnership to include um, executive program designed to prepare multicultural professionals of color for roles in the, in the top leadership suites. And Bev Vigil has a broad personal portfolio. She is a strategic advisor to CEOs and senior executives to Fortune 500 companies about best practices for effective, diverse talent management, succession planning, and retention. She's a leadership and career mentor to women and an occasional man. Uh, and to multi multicultural professionals, me being one of those. She serves as a New England selection panelist for White House Fellows Program. And most important of all, Bev Edgel has been a friend and a mentor and a partner in the complicated and challenging task of getting together the Commonwealth Compact. Bev Edgel and her panel. The panel and I have the pleasure of, at, of, of asking and answering the question, so, not, so, so what, now what, right? It's probably what many of you are thinking. We've heard some very in, in, interesting information this morning, and for many of us, it's not anything new. Many organizations, including the partnership, have been leading this type of work for many, many years. But what's new about this morning is that we're working together as a collaborative to change the face of Boston and to demonstrate our commitment to this work. Now, um, we have a plan this morning to hear from some panelists. I'm going to uh, suggest that we kind of modify our strategy here in the interest of time. And I really would like for us to be able to answer the question, so what, now what? And because we know that the work of diversity is pretty broad, that is, it, expand, it spans from everything from looking at governance to vision and strategy to workplace dynamics to vendor and supplier relations, we're gonna this morning just focus on three distinct areas. The first being CEO leadership, the second being workplace diversity, and the third being how one organization has taken the leadership role in rebuilding Boston's brand for diversity. So what we're gonna to do together, I'm going to introduce the three panelists. I'm gonna ask the panelists to take just about three minutes to tell your story, and then I'm going to ask the panelists a few questions, and be, because we're running short on time, we will not have time to get questions from the audience, but the panelists will be around after we're done, and you can ask them questions directly. So let's start with Steve Ainsley. And Steve Ainsley, as you may know, is the publisher of the Boston Globe and head of the New England Media Group. Mr. Ainsley was formerly the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Regional Media Group and is currently on the Board of Directors for the Greater Chamber of Commerce, the United Way of Massachusetts and the American Press Institute and the Greater Boston Food Bank. 
And we've asked Steve today to talk about the role of the CEO and the CEO's commitment to diversity, and specifically, what should a CEO do? So Steve, if you wouldn't mind taking three minutes to do so. <laughs> I got I'd appreciate message, that. Bev. Thanks. <laughs> uh, well, thanks. Uh, Carol made much in her remarks about um, the, uh, the very positive approach that many CEOs took to the, the level and standards of diversity in the workplace. And I'd, I'd like to talk, just tell a story that I think uh, exemplifies my approach to that. Uh, last week at the Globe, we had uh, a gathering of about uh, 30 or 40 students from throughout Boston who work on a, a citywide newspaper that we publish several times a year called Teens in Print. Uh, the students write it, they do a lot of the editing, they take all the photographs, uh, Globe staffers help uh, put it together. Uh, we've been doing this for about five years now, and I made two observations when we had this little celebration at the Globe, which the mayor was good enough to attend as well. And the first observation was that these 30 students represented uh, probably the most diverse collection of people you could possibly imagine. Uh, they're all ethnicities, uh, men, women, short, tall, fat, thin. Uh, it, it was a, a real polyglot group. And the other thing I realized very quickly was the cohesion within the group, the mutual respect, the collaboration, how much fun they were having. And the reason I tell this story is when I answered, um, am I satisfied with uh, the level of diversity and diversity efforts at the Boston Globe, uh, it was a very easy and quick and resounding no, because we're not there until we look like the teens and print staff. And, and we've got a long way to go before we look like the teens and print staff. Um, so that's aspirational, and that's not perfect world stuff, because that perfect world exists. It exists with the, the youth in our community, or at least pockets of the youth in our community. So how do we get there? Um, the standard bromide is the CEO serves as champion, and, and I agree with that. But in the short time allotted here, I would say that the role of the CEO of any organization is to make sure that diversity exists at a grassroots level. It's, it's certainly not enough for me to be satisfied and for me to exercise my efforts. It needs to push down throughout the organization. And to do that, um, we need to become joiners, uh, not just me. I mean, I, the group I joined was, was this group, as have all of you. But we need to uh, create an environment in our organization where many, if not all, of our employees join diversity efforts. Um, our top recruiters, our members, and I have a list here, I won't read it, but are members of a variety of local organizations that all represent uh, very important minority uh, professionals, whether they be accountants or journalists or so forth. Um, we join those organizations and then we invite them into the globe. This is a very low cost, low impact effort. Uh, and what it does is enable our employees to network with these organizations. Not me necessarily, although I do but our reporters, our advertising salespeople, our editors, uh, they speak to these groups. The groups love to come to the Globe, incidentally. Uh, they love to see the presses. They love to kind of mix with our, our journalists. But most important, they, they like to see a different environment, and it's a great opportunity for us, and it's something that we do very consciously on an ongoing basis. Uh, if you simply have one person in the organization who is your diversity czar, uh, that's not nearly enough. Uh, it needs to permeate the organization and you do it by joining. I would also point out uh, the one thing that we've started doing recently, which is free, and it's a tremendous uh, opportunity. I was talking to some folks here about this uh, at the outset of the uh, breakfast this morning, is to join social networking sites. Uh, our people are all members, or many of our recruiters are, uh, they have their own Facebook sites. I have one, incidentally. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we, all, we join the Facebook uh, sites of various uh, minority uh, in, uh, uh, professional organizations. It's, uh, it's easy, it takes you about 10 minutes to do so, it keeps you up to date. Uh, our folks uh, engage frequently back and forth uh, on Facebook or Twitter or whichever, whichever one of these you enjoy. And uh, for those that, uh, for whom joining an organization is either economically or uh, perhaps a, a constraint on your time, uh, this is not, and it's free, as I said, and I strongly encourage you to do it. One last point. Uh, the, uh, the notion that uh, uh, only 19% of the organizations have some sort of incentive plan uh, rel relating to diversity stunned me. 
Uh, it, it really surprised me. Uh, it's not that we do everything right at the Globe. Uh, that should be evident to most of you. Uh, incidentally, I want to I thank the, uh, all the references to I read in the Globe. I want to ask every one of you today to start one sentence when you're talking to somebody with I read in the Globe. Um, but, but we do. Our senior management team all has uh, a diversity goal every year, and it does have an impact on their bonus. There is a financial inducement for them to, um, to uh, work hard at diversity efforts. It shouldn't be thus, to be honest, but, but it works. And uh, the fact that 100% uh, of the CEOs, or I shouldn't say CEOs, of the organizations said that they, uh, they value diversity, but less than 20% actually have it as part of their management team's goals uh, is something that's easy to correct. I, I take issue with the fact that it's difficult. It's not that difficult. It's pretty simple and would strongly encourage uh, us to move that number up this year. Great. Thank you, Steve, very much. Thank you. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Deborah Enos, who is president and CEO of the Neighborhood Health Plan. Both locally and nationally, Deborah Enos is involved in organizations such as the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans, the Association of Community Health Plans, Community Health Centers, advocacy groups, state regulatory agencies, and others. She also serves on the board of the American Heart Association, the Association for Community Affiliated Plans, Community Health Center Capital Fund, Community Health or Community Medical Alliance, Massachusetts Association for Health Plans, Massachusetts Association for Mental Health, Massachusetts Health Payment Policy Advisory Board, and the Whittier Street Healthcare Foundation. Most recently, Deborah Enos was honored to be appointed to the Massachusetts uh, Special Commission on Healthcare Payment System. Thank you. And Deborah, we've asked Deborah Enos to speak to the issue of workplace diversity. Thank you, Beverly. Um, can everyone hear me? Uh, one of the things that I've learned with uh, diversity is the size of chairs of whatever. I'm a relatively small person, so we're, we're going to work on that. But um, well, I'm going to take a couple of minutes. And when I uh, thought of the topic of the business case for diversity, um, I want to draw sort of an analogy came to my mind. And I'm sure many of you, if you haven't been a recipient, have seen in movies or TVs these scenarios where um, someone has a gift and there's like a big box, a big gift box, which is obvious, and then you start to move in and there are different sort of boxes. Uh, I've had that opportunity a couple of times. I have to say I uh, entered it with a level of excitement and a little bit of nervousness as I sort of moved my way into those boxes and you get to something that's pretty small and I said, you know, this either is going to be a something I'm really, really going to like, or I'm going to have to put on a, a really gracious face and uh, remember that it's the gift, uh, the thought that counts. But uh, as I thought about the business case uh, for NHP and for diversity, I thought of a similar uh, scenario. And for us, the big box, if you will, the obvious case, has to do with the nature of who NHP is and who we are here to serve. Uh, NHP was founded 25 years ago by the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers in a business forum. And our purpose then, as it still is now, predominantly is to serve underserved uh, populations in the Boston and other urban areas. Our membership base is 63% uh, people of color. More than half have a language other than uh, English as their first language. And there are many different cultural and ethnic groups represented. So at a very uh, sort of obvious level in terms of the business case for NHP to be diverse is to serve that membership both from the perspective of the philosophy of the organization and our board and leadership to have a company that's representative of our membership, but at a very practical level, uh, we need people who speak the languages of the members uh, that we serve, both in our clinical area, in our customer service area, et cetera. So there is a very sort of basic, if you will, business case. But sort of following that analogy, as we sort of move into those gift boxes at another level, um, we, about 10 years ago, formalized a diversity committee. Now, we've always been a fairly diverse organization, but one of the things that we realized is by having the, the benefit of so many different types of uh, 
individuals as a part of our team, that there was a responsibility uh, to uh, create forums for them to talk about uh, what their experiences were in the company to sort of serve as a pulse, if you will, uh, for the organization, um, but also to develop plans and to have input to leadership in terms of opportunities, uh, both for advancement, for enrichment. So we began a number of formalized programs through that committee with uh, leadership from my predecessor, uh, where there was everything from reviewing uh, reports in terms of how we were doing with respect to hiring, promotions, uh, if there were any issues that were going on in the organization, an opportunity for people to uh, share their thoughts on that, um, but also to sort of celebrate, if you will, the differences amongst us. And also, we began, um, at that point, a formal uh, diversity training program, which many of those individuals were involved with and were ambassadors for, and that to this day is still mandatory uh, throughout our organization. Um, but as we moved on, um, something interesting happened a couple of years ago, and that was with the formation of a business strategy committee as a part of our diversity efforts. And what we started to see is that in addition to some of the more traditional types of activities that one would see with the diversity committee in terms of celebratory types of events, inclusive events, uh, also looking at our statistics, et cetera, what we started to see is really that the diversity forum became a catalyst uh, for really impacting our core strategic initiatives. Um, initiatives such as efforts around increasing mammography rates for our members, uh, initiatives around uh, looking at the awareness issues and prevention of domestic violence amongst our members, looking at issues pertaining to our workforce, uh, self-defense, issues of aged parents, how would people adapt to that. And what really has happened is that although diversity is a great word and a great term, really what has become in our organization is that it's really become synonymous with the really key and focal point of employee engagement in the organization. Um, not only is it on what are typically thought of as topics that a diversity committee or an initiative would look at, but it has really encompassed the entire organization and has reached out. And I, I really think the reason for that is that there has become a recognition that the benefits and the advantages of a cross-functional group all levels in the organization. I'm on the committee, I don't share it. Um, I'm actually not even an officer, I get to just be a member, which is, which is actually kind of nice um, for uh, an occasion. Uh, but there are all different departments, all different racial, ethnic, uh, gender, sexual orientation, uh, physical abilities, all represented. And what has happened is that there is a recognition that with that consortium there is an energy, a creativity, um, a motivation and a dedication that is a catalyst for many of the initiatives. And so everyone wants to tap into that group as the focal point, if you will, for their initiative. In fact, we have to monitor uh, their activity. They actually all have day jobs as well, and they have great leaders, but they really sort of spearhead a level of energy. So for us, the business case for diversity has been um, an extreme asset for building, retaining, motivating an engaged workforce, for improving the services that we provide to our members, and as importantly, uh, benefiting the larger society through the various social causes that we're involved with as an organization. And that's sort of the special prize that's in the center and really has been the most valuable of all. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So from the comments that we've heard made by Steve and from Deborah, you can see that when you're looking inside of an organization, it's beneficial to have the CEO leadership that Steve described in terms of specific activities that one might engage in, such as becoming a joiner of diverse organizations. Secondly, looking for free or low cost uh, opportunities such as joining social networks. Finally, ensuring that there are incentive plans for managers 
examples in terms of working with workforce diversity from Deborah include making sure that you acknowledge um, the connection between your diversity strategy and your business strategy, creating a forum to get feedback from the diverse talent you have on board, and understanding that your workforce strategy should be driven by the context that you're in. So we've attempted in a very short time to give you a look into ways in which you can address the issues that were presented as a result of the uh, baseline report in the, from the organization's perspective. Now what we'd like to do is to ver take a very quick look at the work of one organization here in Boston um, that's basically, from where I stand, has taken a very significant leadership role in helping to change the brand of Boston from the outside. And to talk with us about the work that he's done is Jim Rooney, who is Executive Director of the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority, which oversees the Boston Convention Center the John, the John Hines uh, Memorial Center, Backed Bay Boston Common Garage, and Mass Mutual Center in Springfield. Since Jim Rooney has taken over at MCCA, bookings at the new BCEC have exceeded projections and conventions at Boston facilities now generate $500 million in annual economic impact for the greater Boston area. Under Jim's leadership, the BCEC was named North American's Convention Center of the Year, and in 2007, by a leading industry publication, was recognized as the best event facility in Boston by banker and trademen readers. Please welcome Jim Rooney. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Beverly. I, I see a lot of friends in the audience, and uh, those of you that know me know that uh, a panel entitled uh, So What, What Now is just perfect for me. Um, you know, as I think about the, the Commonwealth Compact, the, the first step of signing and embracing uh, is perhaps the easiest. Um, there's many people who have spoken before us that said this is difficult work, this is hard work. Um, the next steps are reflecting, uh, particularly on your organization. Uh, I like to think of it as looking at yourself naked in the mirror uh, and seeing all the flaws that you have uh, and then deciding to do something about it. So step one, signing, step two, reflecting, step three, acting upon it. Uh, and as I think about our organization, uh, I can tell you that one year ago today, uh, as we uh, joined the Commonwealth Compact, um, we have a board of 13 members. Uh, Gloria Larson, our chairman, and I met with the governor and, and some of his team uh, about that board, uh, and there were zero people of color uh, on that board at the time. Uh, Governor Patrick has since appointed three people of color, Mo Cowan, Daryl Settles, and Carol Fulp to our board. So uh, we've embraced it, we've reflected, and the governor has acted upon it uh, by changing uh, the makeup of our board. Uh, and, and that's what I mean about, uh, about uh, what now, so what? Uh, what are you going to do about it? Um, it, each of us brings to this kind of a personal journey um, uh, that, that forms their thoughts about diversity and, and sort of their role in, in, in leading efforts in our city. Mine is that I'm a lifelong Boston resident. Uh, I grew up in South Boston, uh, two blocks away from South Boston High. Uh, 35 years ago today, I was a teenager uh, in a Boston Latin school. Uh, and I was uh, getting up in the morning to walk to my bus across the city. Um, but those of you that know what was going on in 1974 uh, know that to walk to that bus two blocks from South Boston High, I walked through anger, I walked through hatred, I walked through racism, I walked by tactical police officers, uh, some of whom were stationed on rooftops to make sure that, uh, that everything was safe. Um, now, as I reflect on that and think about the progress that we've made in the city, we all feel that way. Uh, there was a picture uh, put up on the slide earlier uh, that, that was emblematic and, and symbolic of, uh, of the times. Uh, as I fast forward uh, to my job today, we do believe we've made progress, and indeed we have. But just like products, places have brands, places have images, uh, places have competitive identities, there's perceptions and beliefs out there. Uh, when I started uh, marketing and selling the new convention center back in 2002, 2003, uh, that really came home. And, and I want to tell you a, story, a quick story about that. 
uh, we decided uh, in talking to the mayor and other leaders in Boston that we would try to compete in the minority meetings marketplace uh, as a business strategy. Uh, people who uh, go to minority conventions spend a lot of money. Uh, they tend to uh, accompany the convention uh, with a vacation, uh, and it was good business for us. In fact, we thought it was low-hanging fruit. We thought that we could go out and, and welcome people to Boston and say, bring your convention to Boston. Um, we thought particularly low-hanging fruit was a group called Blacks in Government. Uh, so we went and we met with them. Uh, we did the things we do for any event. We showed them the convention center. We showed them the hotels. We showed them the restaurants. And then uh, I sat in a room across the table uh, from some of the folks who were on the uh, selection panel. Uh, and we talked about some business things, but then they said to me, why would I bring 10,000 people of color to Boston? Uh, and it was uh, probably a little more direct and a little more colorful than that. Uh, and, uh, and there I was, a white Irish kid from Southie with his ears pinned back, uh, caught very flat-footed about what to do with it. Uh, we met with other groups, we met with Urban League, we went, met with journalists of color, we met with many people, um, and they have the images that I lived in their minds uh, 35 years ago, uh, uh, emblazoned in their, in their heads about what Boston's all about. Um, so we decided that we needed to reflect on it and we needed to do something about it. Uh, in 2006, we started something called Weekend of Discovery, uh, where we fly people from all over uh, America who decide where meetings of color go. Um, we put them up, and, and uh, just like we would any kind of meeting planner, um, and we show them the things that they need to do to make a decision about their meeting. Uh, but we have a lunch, and we have a very special lunch. Uh, and to that lunch, I invite many of my friends. I see Vivian Lee, Clayton Turnbull, Sheriff Cabral, uh, Representative Dorsina Fury. Um, and it's almost like an intervention. Um, I, uh, I talk to... Um, I talk to the people who I deputize as salespeople for the city, and I tell them that we're having to face the perceptions that these people from Texas and from Houston and from Houston and from California and other places bring. They only have these perceptions of Boston uh, in their minds uh, dating back to those times. Um, and I'll tell you, and again to fast forward in the interest of time, it took me uh, four years, uh, but in 2011, blacks in government will be here. I <clears throat> and uh, I'm also report, uh, pleased to report that working with my friend Donnell Williams, this one only took three years, uh, but Urban League uh, will also be here in 2011. Um, And, uh, you know, we continue. Uh, we continue to meet with people. We continue the event. We survey the folks who come and participate in that luncheon and participate in the weekend of discovery. I should mention, uh, and, you know, we unashamedly uh, plan it around stepping out and we bring them to the party and, and, and show them a good time. Um, we continue to do it, but after we've done it and they go home, uh, we survey them and we ask them, you know, has this made a difference? And over 90% of the people uh, that we survey say that it has made a difference. So, um, you know, I, I guess I'd wrap it up by saying that the, the beginning is to embrace uh, the issue to sign the compact, uh, but the next two steps, which are often the most difficult steps, are to reflect and act. Thanks. So, in the interest of time, we have to wrap up our panel, but before we leave, I'd like to ask the panelists to respond to one question comment. And that is to say that as we've heard over and over again this morning, despite what the history has been, despite what the data has shown us, Boston is changing. Boston is changing, the perception of Boston is changing, and the experience that people are having is changing. It's work in progress, but we're moving from the glass being half empty to the glass being half full. So the question to the panelists, your closing remarks, maybe one sentence or less. Um, how do you do that, right? What would you say is the one thing that everyone in this room can do to reinforce the message that Boston is changing? What's the one thing we can say? What's the one thing we can do to reinforce the message that Boston is changing? 
Well, uh, I mean, I'll take the easy way out. Uh, we've got 111 signers to the Commonwealth Compact. Uh, we need more. You know, our goal is, uh, is to have over 1,000. And just think what this room would look like if we had 1,000 signers uh, who were also contributing the data, who were listening to these statistics, who were uh, acting on them. Um, so if everyone who's a member asked one other person to be a member today, we'd have 222 tomorrow. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah. Um, I would say uh, have contact and speak with the youth. We have the benefit in our area of having just numerous university schools and people who come into our area. And I think if there's an opportunity to uh, interact, and I would just quickly, um, I have a son who is 24 who went to school in Washington, D.C., and has been there for the last um, two years. Now, I say you're 24, you're in D.C., President Obama, don't you love it? And he wants to come back home. So his generation, um, he wants to be back here. So I, I think to the extent that we all can have contact with the youth and that treasure that we have to implant the idea that this is a great place to live would go a long way. Great, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Rooney. Well, I, I, believe, in, I believe in symbols, and I, I think I'd say find something substantive and symbolic and act on it and let people see it and feel it uh, as a demonstration of, of your belief in what the Commonwealth Compact is all about, and the rest will take care of itself. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the panelists and your time. And I will say on behalf of the panelists, we look forward to seeing you here next year when the results will be very different than they are this year. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm one of the closers here. Uh, and um, uh, we will be brief. We, uh, we want to get everybody out to their, um, uh, their workday worlds. Um, let, let me just say a few words about why I chose to get involved in the Commonwealth Compact. Uh, when Steve, um, Steve Crosby first approached me about this, I remember thinking, oh, geez, no, another guilt-ridden white guy, <laughs> well-intended, but uh, as a working lawyer, do I really need another unpaid gig? Um, and everyone in this room might say the same thing. As someone, uh, as each of you have one, you know, vocation and probably many avocations, do you really need uh, another oar to pull? But I thought uh, you really do measure what your values are not by what you say, but what you do. Uh, and it was really important. Uh, then I was still the chair of the chamber. It was still important uh, in that role and with that organization uh, to convey some degree of priority uh, to the continuing challenges uh, and the opportunities that we have in front of us. Uh, and, you know, so I, I sort of I sort of parallel, in a parallel sense, uh, measure that against a conversation I had with the mayor the last time I saw him. Uh, and we were talking about the importance of a green city and the importance of uh, um, cultivating a conscience about supporting that over the next several years and all the things that he was doing. And I agreed with him. And then I looked, and you know, he drives a hybrid vehicle, and I drive a Beamer. And I thought, okay, you know, I have work to do. So that, that night I went home and I changed all the incandescent bulbs to fluorescence. Um, the, so, so clearly I have more work to do on that front. But the, what I'm trying to convey is what we say is important, but what we do is critical. And that's why I agreed to sign up with the Commonwealth Compact, and I, and I hope you will too. Um, now, when I say I signed up, I not only signed up in my then role as chair of the chamber, but my law firm, uh, as we say, a national law firm with global capabilities, signed up. A thousand employees, only 275, well, only 600 of which or so are here in Boston. Uh, and, you know, lawyers can find all sorts of reasons not to do anything. Uh, 
and, uh, but the more we talked about it and the more we thought about it, uh, we decided to do it on, on, on a number of bases. One was, uh, it's really the same kind of information we supply, uh, whether it's to federal agencies or peer organizations, uh, and none of it gets this disaggregated to identify us as a firm. Uh, it really gets aggregated under an industry heading, uh, and there's absolutely no risk. Uh, we also decided to sign up because, as lawyers, we pride ourselves on being emblems or totems of the highest ideals, not only of the legal profession, but of the Constitution. Uh, and it was really imperative for us to sign up. Um, we also signed up because despite all the, award, the awards, best places to work, Fortune 100 surveys, we realized that there is much more work to be done. There's much more work to be done to, to create the kind of competencies in our organization and in our profession uh, that will make us the kind of place we truly aspire to be. So I would suggest that there probably isn't an organization represented in this room and beyond uh, that doesn't have the same types of goals. And also, think about the best practices uh, that we will be able to share and the things that we will be able to learn from each other. All those things and more we thought and we hope you feel uh, will be, um, will, will seal the deal uh, and bring you into the Commonwealth Compact. And if you're not already a member, uh, we hope you will. And if you are a member, we hope you'll help us sign up others. Uh, this will be a distinguishing thing for Massachusetts. There isn't any place else in the country that's doing this. Finally, let me just talk a little bit about the hopes and dreams of the people who are in the Commonwealth Compact. Uh, at our last planning meeting, we had talked about this as being an evangelical experience for all of us. Uh, my wife calls me the heathen in the house, and so if she were here, she would, she would see that as an oxymoron. Uh, not that I'm not spiritual, but I, 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 I tend to be very analytical about you know, what I, we, I put my weight and words behind. Um, but I have become evangelical about the Commonwealth Compact. Uh, you know, it's fitting today that we are at UMass Boston outward facing, facing out across the harbor and across, across the ocean. Uh, we tell our children that the world is their oyster. And hopefully they believe us. But we want Massachusetts to be part of that oyster, too. And, you know, as a parent of children who go across the country to go to school, speaking selfishly, I want them to come back. And Massachusetts has so many assets and so many opportunities. And if we don't take the opportunity to share them, to illuminate them, and to build on them, then we are missing significant opportunities. And it's on that basis that we hope you will join this evangelical movement and become si signers of the Commonwealth Compact and help us recruit others. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Georgiana Melendez, and I'm the new director, co-director for Commonwealth Compact, and I fully recognize that I'm between you and leaving. So I'm gonna move through. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today for the release of the report and to talk about the next steps and to be your taskmaster, to give you your charge. As a Massachusetts native, I'm really proud of, that our state produces and attracts some of the greatest minds in the world. I'm also proud of our rich history of innovation in healthcare, education, technology, and industry. Despite our tremendous assets, some of our strongest institutions have been threatened by budget cuts, falling endowments, and dismal investment returns. So in this challenging time, it's even more important that we enable ourselves to take advantage of the best talent, all the available talent, which is all of the talent, not just in this room, but all around Massachusetts. As our nation reshifts its priorities, we cannot afford to lose our out on our talent to other states and other countries. As I've uh, had conversations with folks this morning, they've said the same thing. We don't want people going other places. The challenge that has been taken up by Commonwealth Compact 
and many of our partners and friends who've been working to make Massachusetts a better place, not a better place is not simply the concern of a few committed advocates. It is the mission that will define the future, our future place in the global economy. Today, the state of Massachusetts, the city of Boston, have led by example by making public commitments to support the compact, not just in word, but in deed. They too have signed on and they will submit data, which is the key to making this successful. So you've seen our story, you've heard our case, and over 140 of you, the signers, 111 submitted data for the first round, but there are 140 signers as of today um, in this initiative have bravely stepped up and accepted the challenge before us. Carol, the analyst, has explained that the data has explained the data that establishes the baseline for future reports. The signers and the panel have explained how they're using this initiative to demonstrate leadership in their companies and communities. And the founders believe that this is the time to pool all of our energy to remove the stain from the beautiful fabric that makes up the tapestry of our community. So now I'm challenging you. Take the next step with us. We have an ambitious mission, lofty goals, and we need your help. We need you to step up. First, if you haven't joined, as Ralph said, join today. You can do that on our website, and there are tons of materials around that have our web address on it. Second, get one other company to sign up in the next 60 days. It can be a vendor, it can be a colleague, get somebody else to join with you. Because if each of you would do that, we could exponentially increase our signers and produce data that gives us more representative sampling of diversity across the state, all of the state, and not just Boston. So to those of you who are already signers in this initiative, you've already demonstrated true leadership by joining this initiative and exposing yourself to evaluation. Your next step, because everybody has a job, um, is to take one area from the data that your company submitted, focus on that piece, and try to move that area forward in a powerful way. Diversity is hard work, and there's no overnight fix to becoming a star employer. Something that everyone can do is start in the right direction by changing what they can. And finally, just stay involved. We need you in order to make this work. Your guidance, your counsel, your honest feedback are what have made this not our work, but our shared passion to reinvest in our community together. On your way out today, we have a little gift. Um, it's a flash drive. Everybody loves flash drives, right? Um, it has about a gig of data on it. And on this, you have materials about Commonwealth Compact. It has the, bench, um, the, the report, the benchmark report, it has our key findings. It has everything you might want to know about us, including the video that you, sh that you saw. Share this with your colleagues. Share this around your company. Share this with the person that you're going to recruit in the next 60 days and help us spread the word. To those of us who are signers, advisors, and partners of, and staff of Commonwealth Compact, this is not just another initiative. This represents an opportunity for us to pool our resources to leverage the truth that our sum as a community makes us better and more powerful than our disparate parts. We need you to make this happen. A year ago, Governor Patrick charged us with marching forward in this cause, and many, have you, many of you have stepped up. But now it's time to build on that strong start and speed the day when Massachusetts will reclaim its historic role as a location of choice for people of color. Thank you so much for coming. Don't forget your gift. And can I just, just before we leave, I just want to ask the staff of Commonwealth Compact to stand up. If you have any questions at all, if you want to sign up, if you want us to call you, please come see one of them. Bob Turner, Colleen Richards-Powell. A fantastic team. And if I haven't met you, please come say hello. Have a great day.